Welcome to church. We are so glad that you're here. And we want you to know that when you walk through our doors today, you didn't just walk into a building. You walked into a family. And regardless of who you are, where you came from, or what you look like, you are welcome here. Because at this church, we believe that God is love. And that He is in the business of rekindling lost passions, restoring broken dreams, and filling empty lives. At this church, we believe that life in Christ is not a formula of rules and laws, but a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with Jesus. And His love is infinite and everlasting, without pretense or conditions or discrimination. At this church, we can't stand religion, but we love God. And if you're not quite sure what the difference is yet, we can't wait to show you. We're glad you joined us today. Welcome to church. If you have the Word of God in digital or paper format all over the sanctuary, please hold it up over your head, if you would, please. Thank you so much. Please turn in the precious scriptures to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55 and verses 8 through 9. I come here this morning to tell you grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom there is power to break every chain that is in our lives. I had asked a few weeks ago that as we go forward, if you ever have any questions that you would, you would love to say, you know, if I could ask God one question, what, this is what I would ask. And just write that down, jot it down, and drop it in the offering plate when it comes by with your tithes and offerings. And a few weeks ago, uh, I received uh, uh, several of these uh, notes. But here is one of the notes that I did receive. As a living God, who is all-knowing and, des and desires none to perish, why does His plan include the fall? where so much of humanity will follow the path of destruction, the path to hell? It is a valid question. It is absolutely a valid question. It's a question that the world itself asks every day. And so, as we go today to answer this question, what about evil? We must start with an observation and a reality. The observation first is this is that we really and truly aren't all that concerned about evil. Not when we really think about it. Just bear with me for a moment here. We aren't really all that concerned about evil. What we are concerned with is evil as it affects our lives and our loved ones and our plans. Once evil touches us, whether visually or personally, we ask, what about evil, God? How could you allow this to happen when I am whatever? Serving you, going to church, doing good things? Fill in the blank. That is the observation. The reality is this, is that the Bible is unmistakably clear about human nature. Unmistakably clear. There is no question about it. All people are sinners. The Bible says so. You know, we, as we're children, we, we hear that song. Uh, how do we know these things? Because the Bible told me so. The Bible says that we are sinners. Now, not all people are as bad as they could be. They're not always as bad as each other. But all people are sinners. The Bible is unmistakably clear about this. There is not a single exception to this statement that we are all sinners. According to Scripture, every single person that has ever lived since the fall from grace, and I know right now you're asking, well, wait a minute, Pastor, the, the question was about the fall. I said, I understand. We'll get there. Every single person that has ever lived since the fall from grace in the Garden of Eden is born in sin. That sin nature is passed down from parent to child, beginning with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, their dispositions in God changed. What they essentially were was changed in an instant by their sin. As I've said so many times, God bent down to the man Adam and breathed life into his nostrils. He breathed his light, he breathed life, he breathed his love, and yes, he, re he breathed the reflection of his own glory into man, Adam. 
it says that we are created in the image of God. Essentially, the Shekinah glory of God manifested itself in the lives of Adam and Eve. But at the fall, all of that changed. Their spirits died, the glory departed, and so every human being ever born in the history of the world is born with that loss of glory. Now you need to understand, I just said every single person born since then. Because Adam and Eve were not born. They were formed. And they were formed in the image of Almighty God. And as we're going to see today, they were formed with the same qualities and the same character in many ways in the same thought processes many, many times as Almighty God. So, we have all been born as sinners. Do you want me to prove that? I'm glad you asked. Because it's simple. Here's proof that we were all born sinners. Everybody dies. Every single person that has ever lived that is no longer here, with the exception of two, Elijah and Enoch, has died. One out of every one dies. My prayer is that the Lord returns and that we hear the trump. And as the Lord descends, we, we rise up in the rapture. Wouldn't that be great? I would just as soon bypass the whole death thing if I possibly could. Or at the very least, not have it hurt. No pain involved. I, I, I've heard this saying, I, I would like to die like my grandfather, quietly in my sleep, not yelling and screaming like everyone else in the car. Think about it for just a moment. I know it's hot in here, but you guys will get there. So, everyone gets sick, everyone has trouble, everyone has issues in their lives. Romans 3.10 declares that there is no one good, no, not one. Now, aren't I an encouragement here in this heat this morning. You may notice I'm talking a little loud here. I know that it's warm, especially in the back. And if I see your eyelids dropping, I'll just get louder until I see them pop back open again. So what's the problem with sin? Okay, Pastor Larry, you, we, we understand we're, we're sinners. What is the problem with sin? The Old Testament says that the soul that sins shall die. The New Testament says that the wages of sin are death. Babies in the womb of their mothers die. Sometimes through miscarriage. Nowadays, because of the deep sin in our society, millions of them are murdered in the womb and sold for parts. Even after being delivered alive, some are still murdered and simply thrown away. Now these little ones die before they've ever had the chance of actually committing any iniquity and sin. Why do they die? Because the fact is, is that evil brings death. And death is woven within the fabric of humanity. It simply is. How can this be? Is God not holy? Yes, the Bible describes God as holy in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. When we, when we read the words, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple with glory. And on each side stood seraphim, with six wings, with two they flew, with two they covered their feet, and with two they covered their eyes. And they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You see, when the Bible wants to emphasize something, it says, it, it does it with repetition. It doesn't have exclamation points and smiley faces like you guys do on your text messages. It uses repetition. And that is the only place, other than one other place in the Bible, where there's the trice repeated words. Here it says, God is holy, holy, holy. That tells me that God is incredibly holy, and I am incredibly not. The only other place where we see the trice repeated words are in the uh, Great Tribulation, when the angel flies across the sky and sings out, Woe, woe, woe. Fortunately for Christians, we won't be here for that. So Christ, for, so God is holy. Well then, is God not righteous? Yes. Scripture declares God is righteous and just, beginning in Deuteronomy 32, 4, and onwards throughout Scripture. There are so many times where God is declared as righteous. But how can these things still happen? Isn't God sovereign? Again, we go to Scripture, 
And we see over in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, verse 34, this is something I've preached on many times, things I've mentioned many times to you. In Daniel, chapter 4, verse 34, I like the fan up here, but it's blowing my pages open here. All right. Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king, when he had been restored from eating and living as an oxen in the field, says, Now at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. When did his understanding return to him? When he lifted his eyes, meaning his heart, unto heaven. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. His dominion is everlasting. God is absolutely sovereign. He is a sovereign God. Is God not a God of love? How could evil happen? 1 John 4 8 says that indeed God is love. It's not something that He has. It's not something that He chooses to live out. It says that He is love. Those are all attributes of God. Justice, righteousness, love, mercy. Therefore, as we look at God's attributes, as declared by God's own word, we come to some startling conclusions as we address the subject of evil. First of all, God is more than capable of preventing evil. He is perfectly capable of doing that. He has the power. Second, God does desire to rid the universe of evil. So if both of those are true, Pastor, why does God allow it? Why does He allow evil? If God has the power to prevent evil, if God has the desire to, print, to prevent evil, then why does He still allow evil to take place? Pastor, I don't understand that reasoning. Again, I am glad you asked. I direct your attention to today's passage from the Word of God in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. I'm certain you've heard, read, or seen these many times. The great prophet speaking said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Who is like the Lord? There is no one. Who has thought or known the mind of God? There is no one. So now we ask preacher for my own peace of mind. I need to get some kind of better understanding of how we reconcile evil with that passage that we just saw, with the other passages we read. Well, friends, I certainly can't improve upon Scripture, but what, why don't we talk today about what is in Scripture? I'll simply try to teach here what God has simply and directly said in today's passage. God is saying, can you do anything with your pride? Answer me that. Then he, then he points to the Leviathan. Crocodile, otherwise known in Old Testament days as the dragon. And we all know who the dragon is in Scripture, amen? God says, can you resist him? Can you possibly defeat him? God's message is clear. If you can't resist the sins of your own flesh, of your own pride, if you can't resist the dragon, Satan, do you really want to challenge me on the moral issues in life? Now, I now point out, I realize, all this stuff I've just said is not a big help, is it? And you're going, Pastor, it's still warm in here. Can you move this along? I will. We're going to get through the point fairly quickly. There is some good news, because God's Word does give us some insight into the question of evil. And we always look at God's Word. I have three simple questions for you to reflect on today. And then I have a life point for you to write down in, as, as the answer. Now may I ask, or we ask in our first point today, can't God change the people? To take care of evil, can't God simply change everyone's personality so that they do not sin? Well, of course He could. God could do that. God can do all things. He is all-powerful. But... 
The ramifications of that is that we would no longer have a free will. Free will would be gone. If God forced you to not sin, if God forced you to love Him and do the things that He wanted, your free will in all areas created in the image of God would depart. You would no longer have free will. You would be unable to choose right or wrong because you would be programmed to do only right. So let me ask you this. If you buy a, do a, a, a doll, one of those dolls, and you one of those wind-up dolls, and you wind it up, and all it says is, I love you, I love you, I love you. It might be cute at first, but after the thousandth time, throw it away. You're not interested in that. You're interested in true love, and so is God. If God had chosen to go that route, there would be no meaningful relationship between Him and you, His greatest creation. No ability for us to say, Freely, I choose you, God. I trust you, God. So God made Adam and Eve innocent. God made Adam and Eve in His image. But with the ability of their own free will to make a choice for good or for evil. Give, given the ability to respond to God's love with their own decision. They can make their own free will choice. To trust Him and obey or choose to dis disobey. Now in the Garden of Eden, with the entire creation given to them, they were given dominion over everything. They lived in perfect state. Everything that they needed, they had. They walked with God in the cool of the evening. They had every perfect and good thing. They had all the great fruit. They had all the vegetables. They had anything their hearts desired. God said, this is yours. I give you dominion on it. All you have to do is not eat of the tree of uh, good and evil, of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else you can have. What did they do? I don't think so, the Lord. I don't think you really love me. I need to eat that. Amazing. They chose to disobey. Now listen closely. This is a key point. We live in a world where we can choose our actions, but we cannot choose their consequences. Therefore, the consequences of Adam and Eve's sin affected all of us that came after them. And in the very same way, our free will decisions, listen closely, our free will decisions to sin have an impact not only on us and those around us, but to those that come after us. And all God's people said, that's a hard thing to amen, I know. That's the first point. Second point, can't God compensate for the people? Can't He compensate for the people's actions? Well, God could supernaturally intervene 100% of the time. He could stop a drunk driver from causing an automobile accident. He could stop a lazy worker from doing a substandard job and causing injury and harm to others. He could stop a father who is addicted to drugs or alcohol from adversely impacting his wife, his children, the family. He could stop the terrible things that happen to little children. God could stop gunmen from robbing convenience stores. He could stop school bullies from tormenting the smart kids in school. And yes, God could stop terrorists from flying airplanes into buildings. He could stop ISIS from taking 21 Christians onto the, sh the shores of the, the sea and cutting off their heads. God could certainly compensate for all that. And I get it, that actually sounds pretty good, doesn't it? But if you think about it, just think about it logically for a second. It would certainly lose its appeal. It would certainly stop to look quite so attractive as soon as God infringed on whatever we wanted to do. It's okay to stop them, Lord, but I'm not as bad as them. But don't stop everything I'm going to do. We want God to, to prevent horribly evil things, but we are quite willing to let lesser evil things slide. The little white lies. Forgetting those little sins that usually we forget lead to the bigger sins. Because little sin always leads to greater sin. Little sin never leads to good stuff. It leads to additional sin. You see, it only takes a moment to see the problem. Should God stop all actual 
sexual affairs outside of, message, uh, outside of marriage? Or should he also block our access to any inappropriate but not yet actual sexual actions? Should God stop real thieves? Or should he also stop us from embellishing on our taxes? Should God stop only murder? Or should he also stop any of the many small mistakes in a life that lead a person to commit the murder? Maybe that person just murdered the person that had abused them when they were a child. Maybe that person had just murdered the person that abused their child. Should God intervene in all of these actions? Because we forget what the Lord has said in His Word. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Should God only stop acts of terrorism? Or should He also intervene in our, our lives every time we consider the slightest thing outside of what's in His Scripture? Friends, changing people is not the answer. I think we can see that compensating for people's actions is not the answer. Because that infringes upon our own free will. And all God's people said. Yeah, it's getting a little quieter in here now. Third, can't God just clear away the evil people? Can't God just clear away the evil people? You know, you don't have to get everybody out of it. You don't have to compensate for everything. Just take care of those really evil people, God. And if you remove those really evil people, surely there would be a gradual lessening of evil. But there's a huge problem with this. A huge problem with this. And it only takes a second to see it. There's a possibility that there would be no one left. Amen. People ask the question. You, you know, when, when I'm trying to share the gospel and I, and I point out sin, and people say, oh, you think you're God. Well, I know I don't think I'm God, and the reason I know I'm not God is because everybody on I-95 at 5 p.m. is still alive. That's how I know I'm not God. Okay? So we, we can see that, that there would be no one left. And I'll come right out and say it. God would have to remove all of us. He would. How do I know that? Well, we all sin and we all commit evil acts. If you look up on the screen, we have two passages today. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, up on the screen. I hope it's up there. I hope I didn't leave it off. There we go. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many? All. all. Now that was a nice, good, loud Baptist all. I like that. We also see, we see Ecclesiastes 7.20, For there is not a just man on earth who does God, who does good and does not sin. Well, that's an encouragement. There is not a just man on the entire earth. That means when they say man, they mean mankind, ladies. <laughs> Before you get all excited about that, all right? There is not a single just man on earth. You know, I agree that there are some people that are more evil than, I, than others in our eyes. There are people that are more evil than others in our eyes. But where would God draw the line? Because God would be forced to draw a line. And He would have to draw a line between Him and mankind. Between Him and everyone else. Because guys, God's standard is perfection. Absolute perfection. Perfection. You say, Pastor, I don't understand that. I don't understand. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, says, nor are my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And all God's children said, Amen. So, instead of these options, we come to today's life point. Because really and truly, those are the basic questions that have to be answered on what about evil. What is today's life point? It's that God created a world of consequences. Sometimes we bring down a world of consequences on our part. That's not what I'm talking about. God created a world of consequences. God has chosen in His infinite wisdom to create a real world. A place where you can make real decisions. And those real decisions have real consequences. Because our real world actions affect others. Our actions affect our lives as well, of course. And since Adam and Eve chose to sin, the world now lives under the curse. We are all born with a sin nature. 
Romans 5.12 says that by one man, the man Adam, sin entered the world. Now, more bad news just for a moment. Scripture clearly says that one day God will judge the world's sin and He's going to clean this mess up. But because He is a God of love, because He desires that none be lost, He is purposely delaying His judgment in order to allow some time for people to repent so that He does not have to condemn them. Where does it say that? Again, I'm glad you asked. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, write this down on your margin. Oh, we have it on the screen. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Isn't that good? As some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that they should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Please leave that passage up there. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture clearly says that. Scripture clearly says that there is not one that has been born unto righteousness. There is not a single one. But what our great God does, because God is love, it says that not willing, He is not willing that any should perish, but that just the better people, but that all should come to repentance. All. And so if you're sitting in here today, or you're watching on the internet, and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, you may be sitting there and saying, Pastor, you don't know me, you don't know how evil I am, you don't know how bad I am, I, I, I have these things, you don't know, I, I don't know enough, I've done these bad actions, uh, I don't do the things I should do. You know, the, Revelation 22, 17 says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let whosoever will come and drink freely of the water of life. Now, whosoever will, does that, does that say, once you've read your Bible through, come? doesn't mean that. Well, pastor, I'm not smart enough. It doesn't say, let those of you that are smart enough come. Well, pastor, I haven't been in church in a while. It doesn't say, let those of you that have been in church come. It says, let whosoever will you know, some people have real problems with this idea. As soon as you start talking about this, they start talking about, oh, he's preaching free grace. He's preaching free grace. I can only point to, to what our Lord has said. When he hung upon the cross with the two thieves on each side of him, the, one, of them, one of them cursed him. The other one told him, Lord, remember me. Jesus said, surely I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. This day. That guy hanging on the cross didn't have time to tithe. He didn't have time to, to sing in the church. He didn't have time to get baptized. He didn't have time to build up his, his knowledge of anything. All that he knew was that he needed Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? When God created the Old Testament laws, the goal was to discourage and to punish evil. And since God knows everything and He's omniscient, he, God knew... The law was not the answer. It could only be a tutor. Where does it say that, Pastor? I'm glad you asked. If you look up on the screen, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24. It says, Therefore the law was our, what? Tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Here's what that means. You look at the law... Can anybody sitting here say, okay, I'm looking at the Ten Commandments and I can keep all of those with no problem. How many commandments have we all broken? Louder? All, all of them. Every single person here has broken every single t uh, one of the commandments. I see some of you shaking your hands. Wait a minute, Pastor Larry. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't murdered not a single person. Everybody say amen. You're going to be sorry you said that. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, You say, Lord, I have, I have not murdered anyone. But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, I say unto you that if you have anger in your heart for your brother or your sister, you are guilty of murder. You been mad at anybody lately? Yeah, okay. I got, they got some nervous laughter going on in here. So, let me ask again. How many of us have broken 
every single commandment. I'll raise my hand first. All God's children said, Amen. That's a good place to Amen. All right. It's a tutor. We look at the law and we say, I can't keep that. I can't do that. There's got to be a way out. The Lord says, I send my son. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. See, the fault isn't with Scripture. Psalm 19, verse 7. This is a great passage to write down, to underline, to memorize. Psalm 19, 7 says that the law of the Lord is perfect teaching salvation. It is perfect teaching salvation. The fault does not lie with Scripture. The fault does not lie with God. The fault lies with us. Folks, it's God's desire that for our own sakes that we would obey Him. So that as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 29, that it might be well with us all the days of our life. But we cannot get there on our own. We have been given an amazing, amazing gift. The gift of free will. And we can choose God or not. Because you see, God's plan is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died on the cross. He came from heaven. He is fully God and fully man. He gave himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He died on the cross. He was in the grave three days, but on the third day he arose. And that if we confess within our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we will be saved. Because the ultimate act of evil ever was when Christ hung on the cross. And God not only allowed that to happen, that ultimate evil, it was part of His plan from the beginning. You see, when I come up here each week and I preach, right behind me is the cross. Here's the important thing. Christ is not on it. We serve a risen Savior. He is risen from the grave. He's died for our sins. It was part of the plan. I want you to think about this for a second. This is a nugget. Write it down. You're not going to want to miss this. Do you not realize that when Jesus told us to pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, do you not realize that He knew who was going to have to pay that debt? That He was going to have to pay the debt for our sins? He knew that right there on the spot. So friends, what about evil? I simply point to the God of love that hung on the cross of Calvary. And I say, what about evil? What about God? Amazing, amazing, amazing grace. The Lord has said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, or pardon me, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I feel compelled to close with these words. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion spirit be with you all. And all God's children said, Amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You have been so